Hello Java programmers. Today we will launch into a review in the form of a discussion of coding standards in Java. The slides are posted on Canvas in the learning module and I hope you have Eclipse open and you're ready to follow along with me on our journey. When you go to work, you will almost invariably be working with other developers and probably other developers from around the world with different expectations, experiences, cultures, backgrounds. Many of them will have ways of doing things and many of them will expect you possibly to conform to their standards. The company may have a coding standard that's been published. It's a great opportunity for you to expand your experiences and learn more about how other people do things. I have seen in my career programming standards become a crusade where people are divided and people have arguments and disagreements about how to do things. I strongly recommend that you avoid that. It's generally not worth getting upset over. It's something that we do take seriously and we want to make our code the best code it can be and we have a lot of ownership in what we do. However, it should not divide us and I'm not exaggerating. I've seen some bad situations. Therefore, take everybody's input with respect and think about how to fit in with the group. You may learn to do things in this class. You may have learned to do things in other classes and sometimes you may have to unlearn or adjust those things because the environment you find yourself in is a little different and that's okay. If we could summarize coding standards in one phrase it would be clarity is king. I borrowed that from another colleague of mine at another college. I thought it was genius. Everything we do should have the underlying goal of being clear. And the clarity is important because we will come back and look at our code in the future and other people will also look at our code. And we look at code for the purposes of modifying it or fixing bugs. Yes, we do have bugs in our code. And you will learn that the clearer it is to understand the easier it is to fix. Therefore as you go through your career and you write code you will evolve and you'll get better at writing better code. It's an ongoing evolution and ongoing improvement process that we all go through. Some things that we have touched on in our class if you took Java 1 from me of course IT 1090. We talked about symbol names and we pretty much standardized on camel hump notation. We mentioned Hungarian notation a little bit. We certainly emphasized the importance of descriptive names. And I'm going to flip back over to Eclipse right now and do some illustrations for you. You may remember that we generally started out, or always I guess, by creating a Java project. There are numerous kinds of projects in Eclipse, but the one we always made was a Java project. And we gave it some kind of descriptive name. Sometimes we didn't have a lot of context. We were just demonstrating concepts and not solving a problem. A good name for this project might be Demo and Review.
Nothing new yet. Again. This should look very familiar. I don't use the module info feature that was recently added to Eclipse. When it asks me for a profile, I just select don't create. And then if you're creating a new project in a new workspace, it may ask you about the perspective that you want to work within. And that means what windows do you want open? There are a whole boatload of windows relative to a project. I keep mine to a minimum. And I am definitely going to say, remember my decision. And I'm going to say no. How you do this is completely up to you. The way your screen looks is a very personal issue. If you like to have lots of helpful windows open that you found to be useful to you, then by all means do that. I'm going to click no. I want a clean, mostly empty screen. And over time, things become important to me and I open them but I don't want them open at the outset if I don't need them. If you do want to open some of these windows that you've accidentally closed or you've learned about and that could be very helpful to you, you can go under Window and then under Show View, you can select from the list of known windows. One window we have to bring back quite often is Console. And I like my console at the bottom in its own little dock. Remember, if you drag these tabs around, you can dock them in different places. You can put it over on the left. You can put it over on the right. You can put it at the top, the bottom. Again, completely up to you. I like to have mine at the bottom. Over on the left, I like my Project Explorer. You may like it on the right. You may prefer it somewhere else. That's perfectly fine. And then as you write projects this semester, they will accumulate in the Project Explorer based on the workspace you are in. Remember, the workspace is a container that contains references to existing projects. By looking at this screen, you can see that the only project in this current workspace that I'm in is called demo and review that I just created. And you probably have all kinds of projects from the previous semester because you just took the default workspace each time you opened Eclipse and that's fine too. I have several classes where I'm teaching Eclipse and I do Eclipse development outside of class. Therefore, I like to have different workspaces. But Again, do what's convenient for you. And remember that as you create a project, it puts it in that workspace. That doesn't mean it's locked in there. You can always import it into a different workspace. If you don't know where it is, you can right click on the project, select properties, and then in the resource property of the project, it will show you the folder location of that project. And my workspace is here. It's called In Class Work Spring 2022. And it is under another folder called Spring 2022 IT2045C Java 2 Online. And that's the way I organize my work. I have a folder for each course that I teach. And then inside of that course, I have a workspace folder. Again, something that you develop a feel for over time and probably when you do land that job and go to work, they will have you rethink that architecture completely anyway. Okay, I have a project. It doesn't have any code in it yet. And we were discussing symbol names in order to create some symbol names and talk about them. I need a class and you will recall that from our previous time together we select new and then we select class and if you haven't had my class before that's okay you'll catch up 
and please feel free to post questions in the FAQ or visit me during office hours or email me and I will be happy to clarify things that you may not uh, follow along with that's okay we'll get you going we need a package our coding standard is that code always goes in a package if we don't provide a package when we create the class we get this warning from the new Java class dialog that says the use of the default package is discouraged and that is uh, a, it's discouraged because it's a very widely accepted convention everybody that develops Java code for any reasonable purpose creates a series of packages packages are logical containers for subdividing your code that's all they are we could just as easily throw thousands and thousands of class files into one package however it would make management that much more difficult therefore by creating packages judiciously and sticking to package names and sticking to locations of, of things consistently we make our code easier to navigate and deal with just to demonstrate what happens I am going to create this class without a package and then I will go back in and fix that it's not difficult to fix we last semester always and we'll continue to do so right now created a public static void main method that is our entry point into our project that is where it begins to run the project may have many many classes in it but Eclipse needs to know which one to run first and which method to run first that is that is our main that's how it, Java works again though I'm going to leave the package blank I will click finish I have a class called main and that's great it has an empty main method and that's wonderful I delete this to do comment here it just annoys me but I do have a problem it's not a functional problem it's just an operational problem in that I put this class into the default package you can see that it's in parentheses meaning that there really is no package it's that class is just stuck inside the project without any logical container and let me show you real quickly if I go to the properties for the project again and I open up the folder where this project resides if I click on show in system Explorer in the project properties dialog there's my project residing in the workspace the name of the folder containing the project is the same as the name of the project how convenient if I open that folder there's an SRC folder and that is also reflected in the project Explorer on the left of Eclipse you can see those two things are the same if I open the SRC folder which stands for source or source code there is my main java class that I just created it looks fine if you've got a lot of experience with doing this though you recognize that it is not in a package simply because it's sitting in the SRC folder all right I'm gonna leave this folder open we'll come back and look at it in a moment back to Eclipse again I'm gonna close this properties dialog and put me back into Eclipse proper and then I'm going to suddenly realize that oh no this main.java file is not in an explicit package and I have a minor panic and I get up and walk around and eat some M&Ms and I come back and I realize that maybe I can just change the name of the package referenced in this file and have it all magically get better because I'm not really sure what to do at this point what I know that I need but I'm not sure how to get there is to tell Eclipse that this class resides in a package and then I think back to Java 1 and I maybe do a little bit of searching online 
and I realize that I need a package statement at the top of this module. And packages typically start with a lowercase letter. That's another convention that we follow. And then I need a semicolon at the end. Okay. But even though this line is syntactically correct, I still have an error. And if I hover, it says the declared package main does not match the expected package. And then it's empty quotes, meaning there is no expected package. So I have a problem in that this chunk of code, this module, is telling Eclipse and telling Java that it lives in a package, but the structure of the project does not bear that out. There's a mismatch between main.java and the location of main.java in the project. Eclipse, though, remember Eclipse is pretty smart about some things. Eclipse can tell us or offer us a couple of fixes. It can move this module into that package, thus making the error go away. Or it can take out the package declaration from this module. It's saying, hey, what do you want me to do? Put this, put this file in the right place or edit the file so that it matches where it really is right now. And I know where it is right now is not where I want it to be. That means that second option is not so great. But the first option might help me out. Let's take the first option, move main.java to package main. Look what happens over in the Project Explorer. Eclipse automatically created a, pro a package and put our module into that package. It moved it for us. And you can see the error is now gone in the source code. And I left that window open. If I go back to the uh, the project uh, Windows Explorer, sorry, and I look, the structure of my project has changed now. In the SRC folder, there is a pro, uh, folder called main, and inside main, voila, is main.java, that class file that we created. And that gives you a really good introduction to this commonality of the directory structure where your project resides and the project explorer display. I mean, they mirror each other. If you see the package called main in the project explorer, you can rest assured there is a folder called main in the project on your disk. So packages are logical groupings of classes and packages reflect as subdirectories or subfolders on the storage device. That's pretty neat. All right, I'm getting closer to where I'd like to be. I've got main.java. It has an entry point, public static void main. It has a correct package location. Now I want to make sure that I document this thing correctly. Another one of our coding standards, remember, is a proper comment header at the top of each module. What we want to see there is your name, your email address, the course, the semester, and the year. We want to see the assignment number. We want to see a description of what this module is and what the assignment is. We want to see citations. All right, did anybody help you? Did you find a link that helped you? Did you get some source code from a third party? Hopefully not the whole program, that would be cheating. And then anything else that you want to tell me. Now, we can all agree that when you start a job somewhere, 
you will not be using this style of commenting, okay? Your employer is not going to give you an assignment number and you will not have a course a semester a year. You will certainly have an email address and hopefully you'll still have a name. You won't be a faceless cog in a machine. But we're building good habits. We're built, we're training our mind to want to document things. And you will see that other people do radically different styles of documentation. Sometimes the company doesn't have a preference. Sometimes the place you work, particularly if it's a small operation, they may not have a really complex or involved or specific set of documentation requirements. Or you may be working at a place where the slightest little bug in the code could cause major disaster in the product line or it might cause a satellite to go spinning wildly out of orbit or the ATM to start spitting out 20s in the middle of the night and therefore they have a much higher standard of documentation. That's up to you to figure out. But this is what I want to see in every module that you create. Every .java file, which I refer to as a class file, this is class main, Every one of these little guys should be documented like this, not just the main. And in very short order, next week actually, we will begin creating multiple classes in a project. Until now, everything has been one class with one main and a bunch of methods. Next week, things change tremendously. So get into the habit of adding the documentation and it will serve you well throughout your career. We talked about symbol names. All right, now we're at the point where we can add some symbol names. I'll just make something up, int x. That's a really bad symbol name. It has no context, it communicates no information unless you're writing a program that's doing coordinate geometry and you have X and Y coordinates, then it's probably a very bad idea. So single letter variable names, except in a few narrow cases, are a bad thing to do. We were going to illustrate Hungarian and camel hump notation. Hungarian notation dictates whoops, that the prefix to the variable name is the data type of that variable. In this case, since I'm declaring an integer, the prefix is int. And that works out pretty well in a narrow, narrow, narrow environment where you don't have a lot of data types, but that hardly ever happens in practice. We find out very quickly that Hungarian notation becomes awkward because we just don't have enough prefixes that are meaningful. Therefore, you don't see this as much anymore. You don't see Hungarian notation as much. What we do see, eh, is what we call camel humped. Camelot notation is similar to Hungarian, except there is no prefix and the first word does not get capitalized. They are, they are the same in that we capitalize the first letter of each word to separate from the previous word. And we find that the human brain can deal with this. This doesn't bother me in the least anymore. I don't think it ever bothered me. I think the first time I saw it, it was fine. But if it looks awkward to you, uh, you're going to see this in your career for the most part. Now, if you're a Python programmer, they have their own style. And if you want to meet me at Chipotle, we'll talk about that in private. But we won't go into that here. Love my Python brothers and sisters. Anyway, another thing you can do is use underscores. Eh. And this is called snake case. I guess it's kind of snaky. 
And instead of capitalizing anything, we simply use underscores to separate words. You'll see that. Not as much. Certainly not in Java, not as much. It is available to you, though. What I want from you is consistency. Therefore, if you start an assignment, a project, name your variables consistently throughout that project. The next project, if you'd like to try a different style, feel free. I want you to have that level of flexibility. Just don't be bouncing back and forth between styles in the same program. That's something that would probably annoy most people. If you uh, have been with me for any amount of time, you know by now that I am a camel humped notation person. That's what I do. But I'll tell you, when I started my career, and it wasn't in Java, this is how we named things. We used snake case. And then when I slowly adapted to more modern languages, as programming evolved and changed, I became more of a camel humped notation kind of person. Another coding standard that you may want to think about is whether we should use switch statements or whether we should do everything else, everything with ifs and else's, not a big deal. I certainly use switches all the time. They're especially flexible in Eclipse. So I don't have a problem with the switch. Feel free to, to build those in as necessary. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Brackets. Another thing that I'm fairly rigid on, I do want you to bracket every if and else and loop construct, even if it only has one statement in it. We always use the brackets, even if they're not necessary. And I will illustrate that. Let's do something simple. Int, uh, let's just do number of agents equals 42. We just need a little bit of context here. If number of agents equal equal 42 uh, system dot out dot print line hi. Not a lot of functionality being demonstrated here. This is uh, syntactically correct. It looks fine. But it is not logically correct. It does not conform to our coding standard. Our coding standard dictates that we use enclosing braces even if there's only one statement to be enclosed. This is what we want it to look like. The reason for this is twofold. One is consistently, so every if statement looks the same. And two is if we came back later and put in another statement. Uh, that second statement would then be enclosed in those already existing braces, which makes it harder for us to accidentally make a mistake. Now, if I didn't have the braces, I could still come back and add that second statement, but now it is no longer part of that if clause. It's off by itself, which means it's a completely separate result when we execute the program. Even though it's indented, it's not part of the if. Would this be a Python program, then indenting would make that part of the if because Python does not use braces. It uses indenting to demonstrate uh, constructs, but we're not in Python, so I've already mentioned Python too many times in this video. Always use the braces. Just get into the habit of Whoops, I didn't think that was going to happen. If number of agents equal equal 43, just get into the habit of opening the braces and then immediately starting to enter your code.
before you do anything else you have braces that makes your life easier that makes the opportunity for an error much lower and it just builds consistency into your code okay another standard that you may see that I think is falling out of favor I don't see it as much I don't see it discussed as much it usually generates a little more uh, conflict on uh, in a discussion board is exiting methods out the bottom but I still think it's a good idea and it's a noble goal to work for let me give you an example of that if I throw a method in here I'll just make up a method void how about public static void foo and I got a bunch of code here and I say if uh, x equals 42 return then I've got more code here and then I've got another return at the bottom obviously because if you get to the bottom you automatically return and that is an illustration of a program again that's syntactically correct and it may also be logically correct however you're opening yourself up for problems down the road because if I put some code right here this code that I add at a later date I come back and I realize that there's a bug or an improvement that needs to be made and it might not even be my code however if I add that code it's not going to run if the method exited at line 32 I may be putting in code that I think is going to run but in reality it's not going to run and that's why multiple return statements might not be a good idea another thing that could introduce bugs that are difficult to find later therefore it's nice to have a goal of only one return statement in a method if you're obsessed with optimizing your code so that it runs absolutely as fast as possible then in one of those a lot of those instances you find yourself with multiple return statements but and also could be said to create some kind of twisted logic because you always have to make your way to the bottom to get out when possible though it's a noble goal to work towards exception whoops exception handling we touched on exceptions in Java 1 always be thinking about what could go wrong in your code and what you can deal with so if an exception happens that you can handle you should catch it and decide how to handle it if an exception happens that you can't handle you should still catch it and pass it up the chain just to make your program uh, behave in a consistent manner and we'll do more of that as we go along but I always want you to have exception handling in the back of your mind documentation an almost universal standard our Java Docs by the end of the semester last year we were requiring Java Docs we will continue to do that remember a Java Doc is simply opened up and right above a method with a slash two stars so slash star star and then press enter Eclipse builds a Java Doc framework for you and then you fill it in so this method dit, dit, dit. what does this method do if we create a more complex method with a more interesting interface you will see the Java Docs uh, have more value so public static int beta double uh, speed string uh, name 
Okay, there's my new method. It is a method that accepts a double followed by a string and it returns an integer. Let me just put the return statement in here so the error goes away. Return 42. Now the error message goes away and everything looks fine. But I'm not done yet because I need to build the Java doc expression, the Java doc comment for this method. Once again, the very top, right above the first line of the method, right above the method signature, slash, star, star, enter. And voila! Eclipse builds you a wonderful Java doc framework. The first line is left blank for you. You fill it in, uh, compute the max speed of an unladen Sparrow, whatever. And then you provide a brief description of the parameters. So max speed of a bird. I'm making this up as I go along. It's very silly. Uh, name of the sparrow. And then you return something. You need to describe what that is. The max speed. This is programmer documentation, folks. The other programmers who will read and use your method will depend on the Java docs to use that method. We don't want other programmers to have to go down and study your code to figure out how it works. We want to provide Java docs to let them continue to do what they want to do and make efficient use of your code. And that also applies to you. When you come back in six months and you want to use this method, you can read your own Java doc and that will tell you, oh, here's how I use that method. Also notice what happens if I go back up to the main and I reference that method. Remember, it's called beta. It doesn't know what it is yet, okay? And the reason it doesn't probably is because of this error down here. Let's see if I can make that work. Hmm. I'm trying to get Eclipse to consume this Java doc so it becomes part of what I'm doing up above. Maybe if I hit save, let's try that. Now if I hover, see it knows that it exists right there. It knows there's a method called beta that accepts a double and a string, but it doesn't. It's not bringing up the Java docs. So what if I say 42 comma birdie? Whoops. There we go. Okay. It just it's usually more flexible than that. Don't worry. It'll it'll work for you. But there's the Java doc that I created in line 29, and it shows up when I hover over the method. How about that? There it is. And you might say to yourself, self, well, that's no big deal because all I can do is scroll down and see it right there. But imagine if it's not even in this package, if it's in another package buried deep in your project, and all you have to do is hover, and it will show it to you which is really powerful. That means Java docs are a standard that we will adhere to. Whenever you create a method, use Java docs to describe that method. A little bit down the road, we will also uh, decide that whenever you create a class, you will use Java docs to describe that class as well. So there's two effective uses of the Java doc comment notation that we want everybody to take advantage of. Another thing that we do, another standard that we follow, is when we create a class, we will write a two-string method for that class. Now, we haven't created any classes yet because that's a topic for next week. So I won't spend a lot of time on that right now, but you will see me do it next week. 
And we didn't do it last semester because we didn't cover classes last semester. The purpose of that course, IT 1090, is to go right up to objects and classes and then stop. So you're going to get that soon. When we think about how we do things in the real world, and also how we will do things in this class. Very often you will be given a task such as design and implement a class that dot 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 does something. And hopefully you will be given some kind of logic to implement or a document provided by a systems analyst or maybe you have enough problem knowledge, domain knowledge, to do that yourself. A lot of times there will be someone working with you who knows how the system is supposed to work and they will communicate that to you in the form of a design document or maybe something a little more casual. And then it will be your responsibility to make that into a program or it's really not a, a fair characterization to say make it into a program. It's better to think of it as making it into a class or a series of classes because you may not be the one responsible for making a quote unquote program that begins and ends and launches and does something. Rather you're responsible for a part of that program that provides specific functionality that you and other people will be using to build this greater good. So in this class I'm going to make it a point to say create a class that does something or modify a class that already exists to do something else. And that's how we can think about the problems that we will address. Thinking back on what we've already talked about, kind of looking at it from a big picture perspective, we're always going to create an Eclipse project. Or sometimes I may give you that project, but either way there will be a project. That project will have one or more packages. As we get more involved in our work and we learn more about how projects go together, we will add packages. There will be an entry point. Now, this is somewhat of a departure from a real world scenario in that you may never see an entry point. I mean, you're going to be given jobs to do that involve modifying classes or creating classes. And somewhere in another part of the world, in a different time zone, more developers are using your classes to build a program, a project that accomplishes something. But in our world, that wouldn't make a lot of sense because then all you'd be allowed to do is write code and turn it into me without testing it. Therefore, you will need an entry point. If you refer back to what I've already done in this video, I created a main class and in that class I put in public static void main as our entry point. That's our, our method. And that always has to be the same. We don't have any choice. That method signature has to look like this. Public static void main. And it may have a different name for the argument list, but that doesn't matter. Everything else on that line matters and it has to be the same. If it's not, then your project simply will not run because Java doesn't know where to start. It doesn't know where the entry point is. And I'll illustrate that. Let me just change the name of this method from main to main x. And now I'm going to have a problem. If I click run, it doesn't know what to do. 
And this is one of those cryptic messages that you might get. And hey, you have a project. It might even be syntactically correct. It might even be logically correct, but I don't know where to start. Eclipse doesn't know where to tell Java to begin. But if I fix that, then I rename that method back to main, the expected name. Now I get a different response from Eclipse. And Eclipse says, OK, I can figure out what to do with this. Now I always check the box in the save and launch dialog that says always save resources because I don't want this to come up again. In our little world, we don't need this save and launch dialog to come up every time we click the run button. All right, I just click the always save button. And then I click OK and my program will run. And you can see it printed out high. Nothing exciting, but we are illustrating the point that you've got to have an entry point. If you think back to, or think ahead to, a project with thousands of classes and hundreds of packages, that main, that entry point, that public static void main, may be buried in a package that you never see. You never touch it. You don't know where it is. It's only your job to write individual classes to contribute to the functionality of the whole. And that would be great if there were other people working with you in this class and providing an entry point. But since there aren't, you have to make your own. And that's why we have this coding standard, a class with just the entry point. We will decree then, we will say that it is a standard for us that you will create a main class, capital M-A-I-N, and in that class will be a method that will be your entry point. The reason for that is twofold. That builds consistency so I can grade your work easily because I know where everybody's main is when I look at their project. And that also helps you build the good habit of creating an entry point. Another benefit that you might not even think about right now is that when you're done with your development process and your classes have been tested and they work, you can remove this main class and your other classes will still function properly. Okay, so your main class is just there to provide an entry point. It's not there to do anything else. Another standard, as we've already talked about, is JavaDocs. We will JavaDoc all of our methods and all of our classes. You can skip the JavaDoc on that main class because it it's, doesn't really need it. What I would like you to do in this class is when you get an assignment, start a new project, you can certainly drag in work from other projects that you've done. I want you to do that. I want you to be smart enough and conscientious enough and aware enough to recognize that, hey, I wrote this code already. I wrote similar code already and I'm going to reuse it in this project. That is very cool. That is something you should aspire to. If you've written something once, you don't have to write it again. Reuse your code. Copy it into the new project and take off from there. You may have to modify it a little, but you've still saved yourself a lot of time. Or if it's written perfectly, you just plug it in and go. Either way is terrific. Now, if we were getting really involved in building more enterprise-wide work, we could build a hierarchy of projects. I'm sorry, packages. And here is a package hierarchy that is conceivable. And it reads from left to right, top to bottom. So the highest hierarchy is EDU, and then underneath that is UC, University of Cincinnati. Then enclosed in that is 2045C. Then enclosed in that is the semester. Then enclosed in that is the assignment number. Finally, there's the person who wrote it. And that's very common to build a hierarchy of packages to manage 
your classes more effectively. Now we, we won't do a lot of that because we're writing really simple stuff and it probably just adds unnecessary complexity. But as you get better at this and as you get into more advanced work, you will be writing or building package hierarchies like that. I said a moment ago, and here it is on the slide, make your entry point class, call the class main with a capital M, put your stat public static void method in there. That way I know where to find it, you know where to find it, everybody else knows where to find it. And you can get rid of it when you no longer need it without affecting all of the other classes that you worked so hard on. What should the main do? Okay, we know that that main class and that main method provide your entry point, which is invaluable and crucial. But what else should it do? Well, it may have to instantiate other objects of other classes and invoke methods that belong to those classes. Okay, so we haven't talked about that yet, but we will. So the main kind of sets up the operating environment and kicks everything off and gets all of your code rolling. The main should be able to go away, disappear, vanish without make without breaking any of the other classes. They should all still work. And again, that's because somebody is going to take your class that you worked so hard on and make it part of their project but they're not going to want your main because they already have one. Therefore, your main should be in a separate class all by itself and not have any bearing on the functionality of everything else that you did. And then something else that the main could do is spit something out so we can read it, okay? Display something. Hey, here's what I did. Here's the results I got. And here's whether it's right or wrong. And that may be something that is extremely useful. Usually it is. But it's also something that we can rip out and throw away because it doesn't affect the functionality of all the other classes that you wrote. Documentation. We've demonstrated Java Docs. We've demonstrated what a student of mine called a flower box. I don't do it as elaborately anymore as I used to, but if you think about embellishing this a little, it kind of looks like a flower box. Believe it or not, yes, we used to do this. And now it kind of looks like something that's over the top. If it makes you happy, if you like ASCII art, then maybe this is something that you want to add to your program. It will not improve your grade, I promise, but it is kind of pretty. A student of mine once referred to it as a flower box and that kind of stuck. Comments to explain your logic. Again, documentation means comments. What are you doing? If you go back to something that you did last semester, what kind of documentation did you have perhaps? You may have had something like this where I wrote the comment camel hump notation next to the variable declaration of a camel humped variable. Okay. Doesn't really communicate a lot about the functionality of the program. It merely talks about the concepts that we're demonstrating in the code. What you may have also done this. You may have written something like this declare an integer whoops and back in Java 1 back when you were just getting started and I was twisting your arm and insisting that you comment things that was a comment you told me that you were declaring an integer now you come back to that 15 weeks later and it's like oh my goodness what is that doing in there or I don't need that anymore and you're right you don't at this point you don't because you know what a, dec a variable declaration looks like so that kind of comment 
could go away. And I told you in Java 1, I'm sure I mentioned it many times, that if you go back and look at code that you wrote last year, it's going, some of it's going to look silly because you've just grown that much. It's time now then to think about what you're commenting and for the most part, your comments should be focused on what do other people want to know about my code and that other person could be me because I'm a programmer too and what will I want to know about my code if I come back and revisit this code in 12 months what will I not recognize okay what assumptions am I making today that I won't know about tomorrow and I guarantee you that will help you shape your thinking when you write comments in your code And even as you've evolved from one semester to another, you will continue to evolve. So do the best you can. Show me that you can document. I'm not grading you on the quality of your documentation. I'm grading you on the attempt to document. You just need to do it to get better at it. We talked about the flower box before here I've just enumerated all of the things that I showed you in the code I think there is one thing I left out of the code which was the course number so if that was unclear course number and course title would be part of that flower box and again remember that's not something that your employer is going to want to see but it makes sense to us in this context at the bottom of the slide, here's a tweet from one of my students who, after several years in the business, he's become a very successful developer, worked at several companies, and now he's starting his own business recently. He commented in a tweet that he thinks lack of comments appear unprofessional. And he, I think he is hearkening back to the days in my class when I twisted his arm and forced him to put some comments in. Now, we're going to get better and we're going to expand greatly on this slide. Write one or more Java classes that implement the assignment. So we'll talk more about what those classes should look like and how you implement classes. We're just not ready to do that yet. Just keep in mind, modular, 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 breaking things up into classes and organizing classes into packages is the way we do things. Revisiting variable names, not too short, not too long, consistently styled. Remember, if you start a program, if you start a class in snake case, continue on with snake case throughout that class. Hungarian notation is fine if you like. Don't see a lot of it anymore. Camel humped is probably the standard today in Java, C Sharp, C++ perhaps. Many mainstream languages, you see most people using camel hump notation. And I think the reason for that is because it's easy to read and Hungarian became awkward. And most of the people that wrote the books learned how to do it in camel humped and most people that read from the books learn how to do it in camel humped. The length of a variable name is tough. It's, it's an art as much as a science and if I jump back into my code again and I say string last name of next door neighbor who moved away in 2021. The variable name is last name of next door neighbor who moved away in 2021. Okay, pretty detailed, pretty descriptive, but a bit of a pain to read when you use it in an expression and even a bit of a pain to type. So probably not useful. 
in the long run. Yes, it's correct. Yes, it's descriptive. Yes, the syntax is fine. But in the long run, I think you will learn that that's a little too long. And you're going to meet people who use long variable names. And you're going to meet people who use short variable names that are very terse and don't communicate a lot. Just plan on growing and changing as you move through the field. If you do this in an assignment, I will chuckle and I'll get a kick out of it. I won't take off points. I, it's not wrong per se. It's just a little bit awkward and probably something that would cause you a little bit of grief at work. And they might ask you not to do it anymore. A quick story. Um, if I revisit this indenting topic that we talked about earlier, we talked about how you open a curly brace and you indent, and even though the indenting doesn't communicate anything to the logic of the program, it still makes it easier to read. Another aspect of indenting is where you put the brackets. Now you can see on my screen in line 30, that's where I like to put the opening bracket. I like it on the same line as the if statement. If you look up at line 20, I like it on the same line as the public static void main as the method signature. The method signature ends with the closing paren, and then I follow that by a space and then the opening curly brace. Okay. I could also put that bracket right there. Now I've got the opening and closing brackets for this if statement on separate lines, on their own lines, and they're under the I and if. And I could even, if I wanted to, I could move them out such that the opening and closing braces are now under or tabbed in one tab. They're indented the same uh, space as the, the code in the inside the brackets. And I could do that. All of those syntactically correct, no, no errors there, just different ways of writing code. And you're going to find people that do all kinds of different ways of locating their braces. Commonly, one tab, okay, one tab is the indenting rule each time you open a curly brace. That's the way most people work. Now in Eclipse, one tab is one, well, you can't see it, but it's four spaces. By default then, an indenting, uh, an indenting code inside of a curly brace is indented one tab, which expands to four spaces. And you may find people who indent one space or two spaces or five spaces. I mean, there's just different people do things different ways. And I did some work for a company in a moonlighting uh, capacity. I was working on weekends and evenings writing some code. I delivered the code and they would use it in their systems. And I never set foot on site. I never met anybody that worked there, I don't think, just over the phone and email. But they were local. Eventually I thought that maybe they'd want to hire me because I wasn't happy at my job at the time. I reached out to them and said, are you willing to hire me because you know that I can do your, I, you know that I can do the work because I've been writing code for you for quite a while. And their response was, we will hire you if you change the way you indent. That came from their developers. What had happened was that the code that I delivered was fine. It just didn't look like their code, which kind of drove them nuts. And I suspect knowing them, I got to know them because I did go to work there, that they went in and reformatted all of my code after I delivered it. But they were willing to hire me. They were happy with my work. They just wanted me to indent the same way they did. And I think my first thought was, heck yeah, I don't care how you want me to indent, just hire me. And I think my second thought was, why didn't you tell me this? Each time I delivered product to you, I could have changed my style. That's not a problem. So, yeah, there's different styles out there. And I think getting along 
and being a productive member of the group is more important than picking which hill you'd like to die on and certainly where you put your brackets is not a hill to die on at the same time I do expect you to follow my standards in this course because you're just coming up the curve and I think my standards are reasonable and I want everybody's code to look the same consistency we very very often have to abbreviate they're just simply as you saw a moment ago there is simply too much complexity added if we start using very very long variable names so when you do abbreviate abbreviate consistently if you have things that are temporary t-e-m-p-o-r-a-r-y temporary and you abbreviate that to t-e-m-p then don't all of a sudden halfway through a method start changing to a different variable naming style where you're using TMP that's just that's just bad news so remain consistent as much as possible single letter variable names are perfectly fine and expected for loop counters and for array indices in the example on this slide then I declared a variable called I and then I use that as the loop counter in a for loop and you may be more accustomed to seeing it this way and drop that out completely so that's normal and the reason for that is because that variable does not get used a lot so you're not going to see it pop up all over the place so you don't have to make it a complex name with a lot of meaning and there was uh, a seminal book that we all read as developers where they did it this way and that book basically trained all of us if you go way back in time so everybody started using single letter variable names for loop variables from this one book I'll show it to you here's the book that in a way started it all this isn't even the uh, original edition the first edition came out before this one but this book taught everybody how to program in C this book used single letter variable names for loop counters and there were probably books before that that did it as well but the C programming language book influenced a whole generation and even generations after that of authors and programmers and we all ended up using single letter variable names go to's well in C sharp there is a go to in Java there is no go to so you're probably wondering what is a go-to because if the only language you've learned is Java you have never been exposed to a go-to statement don't worry about it <laughs> C++ has it C sharp has it C has it many languages has it have it but Java left it out and they left it out for a reason because it creates what is called spaghetti code very hard to read very hard to maintain often bugs just slip by because the program is so poorly written therefore the Java developers the Java inventors decided no go to and I'm happy with that you don't need it Java has certainly not suffered because of the lack of a go to and when you come back for contemporary programming or a C sharp course next year you will learn that there is a go to if you take the course from me you will learn not to use it I'll talk more about it and you may take it from another professor who says it's okay go right ahead and use it different opinions exceptions again I touched on those earlier and we will fold those into our discussion as we go along your general mindset though is if something goes wrong can I handle it in my code or do I pass it up the chain and let somebody else handle it that's the general mindset of exceptions 
The syntax you should understand from last semester, the theory and practice behind it, we will build in as we go. Coding philosophy. Code is written once and read many times. You write it. If it doesn't work, you read it again and try to fix it. When it finally does work, you commit it to a repository. Other developers make use of it. Other developers modify it, extend it, add to it, add it to other projects. Therefore, just because it makes sense to you on the day you write it, doesn't mean it's going to make sense to somebody else tomorrow or the next day. Therefore, always have that person in mind. Always think about that next developer. That next developer may be you. We highly, highly, strongly emphasize reusable code. I mentioned in a previous slide just a few minutes ago, if I give you an assignment and you realize that a previous assignment would be helpful, reuse that code. Go to that previous assignment, grab that code, and stick it in. We write code in a modular form. We divide it up into classes so that it can be reused. Conceivably, I'm using PowerPoint today, I could write the entire PowerPoint application in one class, you know, PowerPoint.java. It would be 10 million lines of code. It would be awful. It would run today, and if I made one change to it, it would probably break tomorrow. Therefore, we break it up. We modularize it into classes. We break those classes down into methods. That gives us a much better chance, a fighting chance, at getting it to work and being able to fix it down the road and being able to reuse it in other projects. When you do a Word document and you might realize that there is a table in that Word document that would go very nicely into an Excel spreadsheet. So you take the table out of the Word document you paste the table into an Excel worksheet and you don't even think twice about it. Well, guess what? You do the same thing in PowerPoint. You create a table in PowerPoint. You copy the table out of PowerPoint. You paste it into Excel. How much reusable code do you think you just took advantage of? All that table manipulation code that exists in Word also exists in PowerPoint. That's reusable code. If I bring up the font dialog, that should look familiar. The font dialog in PowerPoint is almost identical to the font dialog in Word and the font dialog in Excel. That's reusable code. That's a goal for us. We're proud of ourselves when we can take something that we wrote and use it again and again and again in other projects. That makes us more valuable to our employer and it improves our job security and job satisfaction dramatically. The main, we talked about the concept of writing a public static void main and then being able to rip that thing out and have all of the other classes still work properly and here are the things that a main should do. We'll spend more time on this next week as well. So don't worry too much about it right now. But again, all of these things that the main does are expendable. I can take the main completely away and all of the other classes that I worked so hard to create will still do what they're supposed to do. They'll need a new main They'll need somebody else to provide a main, but they will still work. Here's an excellent book for you to consider. Algorithms plus data structures equals programs. One of my favorite programming books. This is written by one of the most famous computer scientists who invented a couple very successful programming languages. It's not written towards Java. It's written towards the theory of programming, why we do what we do. 
and it will make you a much better programmer because it helps you think about what is a loop and what is a method and why do we create programs the way we create them independent of some language. You're not worried about where the braces go and you're not worried about how many bits are in an integer. You're just thinking about the general philosophy and theory of programming and that will help you tremendously with the big picture of your job. So highly recommended. You can see that uh, I get a big kick out of this every time I show it to students. A hardcover version is $30. The paperback is $135. Uh, wide discrepancy there. And the price changes wildly on this book. Uh, the Amazon book bots have a very tough time with this book, stabilizing the prices. This book is not required for the course, but it is recommended if you plan to be in the field of software development or any related field. The title of that book was Algorithms Plus Data Structures Equal Programs, and I might add to that object-oriented programming or OOP. So an algorithm is how to do something, a recipe, a data structure is how are we going to store the information processed by that algorithm. Syntax is where do the braces go and where do the parentheses go, and that's specific to every language. And then most of the time, most software developers are going to be dealing with an object-oriented programming or OOP language. Java is OOP. Now you may not be acutely aware that Java is OOP because we studiously avoided all the OOP stuff last semester. We didn't talk about it if we didn't have to. But now we are and everything you learn about OOP will be common to other OOP languages. Inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation, data hiding, all the principles of OOP are common to C Sharp, C++, even Python. So if the book were to be rewritten today, maybe they would add a couple more uh, pluses to the title. That's just me being, uh, being nosy. I, went, uh, I thought about programming a little bit. I've taught compilers before, and there's a lot of really interesting theory that goes into categorizing a programming language, figuring out how it should do what it does, how it should manage memory, how it should call methods, whether or not it should be object oriented, should it be procedural, should it be imperative. But if I try to break it down into very broad categories, this is what I come up with. If I, br if I think about algorithms, there are algorithms to sort, search, solve, convert, control, and certainly there are more than that, but I tried to come up with broad categories of things that we do in a program. We search for things, we sort things, we solve problems, we compute new solutions, we convert from one format to another, we turn a device on and off. Maybe monitor would go in here. Maybe monitor is a part of control, I don't know. Data structures. There aren't really that many when you get right down to it. There, We store things as numbers. We store things as strings. We store arrays of things. If numbers and strings aren't appropriate, we just break it down and we organize according to bits, which we call binary. Sometimes we use the term blob, binary, large object. That would be a, uh, a video, a, a song, a JPEG. Those things aren't organized in strings and numbers, they're organized into just streams of bits for the most part. And then we take all of those broad categories and we create hybrid or composite data types, which we will call classes, and you will see more about that next week. And then programs have syntax, okay, whatever language you learn, You've got to figure out where the braces go. You've got to figure out if there's a main. You've got to figure out how to create a project or a package or a namespace or a method or a function. 
So every language has its own syntax. Thankfully, though, if you learn a popular language, you probably learned a lot of another popular language. I guaranteed you if I showed you some C Sharp right now or some C++, you would be able to read a lot of it because those languages are very similar to Java. There are common constructs across many common languages. And then finally, in the fourth quadrant, there is OOP. And OOP is a programming paradigm where we break up things in our program, we model things, and we call them classes. A class is a model of something in the real world. It has properties and behavior, and when we instantiate that class, when we make an instance of that class, we call that an object, and that becomes a variable in our program. So this is the way I kind of view programming from a very high level. You need to know a little bit about all of this to be an effective developer. And even more philosophical, sometimes I get bored at night and I think about categorizing things. Why do we write code? I tried to come up with f broad categories of why we do what we do. One category is to entertain. So we write a video game. Sometimes we provide decision support. We have to write a report generator. We have to sort data and arrange data and investigate data so an end user can look at that data and decide whether to order more size 10 New Balance Triple E shoes or not. Sometimes we need to control things. Very, very important category these days. Your car your refrigerator, your coffee maker, the ATM on the corner, your cell phone. Everything interfaces with devices. Therefore, we need software to monitor and control those devices. And then finally, we write code that will never see the light of day outside of the purpose of demonstrating competence. So I write a program and I give it to my teacher and they give me a grade and that just proves that I know what I'm talking about. And I think these are four broad categories that probably encompass every kind of programming that there is. If there's anything I left out of this, please let me know. Do I need to add a fifth category? Please let me know. This is a list I'm very interested in from an education standpoint and I'd be, I would welcome your contribution to it. Thank you very much, and I look forward to talking to you next time.